Reproducibility is a problem. Um, I'm going to start going to talk about just the general problem and what reproducibility means. Uh, talk a little bit about community standards, batches and controls, segue into color, and then some information on bias. And again, I'll try and keep it short. Uh, reproducibility can mean a variety of different things. In the general biological scale, it can be, can another lab just reproduce your findings? Like, you know, can a particular set of cancer cells that have been treated with a certain thing in your lab and they all died, did that also happen in another lab? And if you want to reproduce that, some of the best options I want to mention are involved video recordings. And I really like that Jove has kind of taken a good lead on that. Um, and the STAR methods are another attempt to kind of enable people to reproduce others' research by including enough information, which is something they frequently don't do. A more stringent definition and kind of more on the replication side is getting the exact same answer with the same starting images and analysis pipeline. And that's only going to be possible if you identify all the steps and possibly provide some starting images for someone else to use. And then just kind of in general, minimal reproducibility is just being able to read someone's methods and figure out what they did. And a lot of the times, even that is challenging. I'm sure many of us have tried to read a paper and say, figure out what the person did. And even though we have you know, some experience in the field, it's very difficult to actually follow along. And interpreting figures is another issue there that I'm gonna try and skip through. So a bunch of uh, information on why there's a reproducibility problem. One of these that I thought was interesting was the fact that there's complaints even in computer science about people just creating a publication without code or without code and data and stuff. So if even the computer science scientists are having problems, then what hope is there for the rest of us? <laughs> All right, this is just a slide on, let's see, the fields that feel like they're doing the best are chemistry and physics, and yet we had the, all those superconductor papers recently that have been either retracted, retracted again, or there was the South Korean group that thought that they had discovered room temperature superconductivity, and that kind of fell apart. But I actually see that last one as a success for science and a validation of the whole preprint process, because it got a lot of attention, some people showed that there were some problems with it. And that all got worked out before it was put into publication and needed a retraction or anything like that. More papers. I think a lot of a lot of these in here are clickable links once you download the file, so you can check these all out. Um, but you know, we're we're all good, right? Now it turns out imaging methods are vastly underreported. This was a chart from that paper, which again, clickable link, showing the percentage of past quality method for the, their methods sections. And oh, I thought I changed this. Apparently I didn't. Okay, so really what I should be highlighting are the past quality percent, not the percent imaging methods. But even so, you see things like nature immunology with a 11% pass rate and you know 31 impact factor. So this is affecting everyone. And you might wonder what kind of super high threshold did they have for these quality methods that so few people passed and it was just three things. You list the objective, you list the image resolution, and if it was fluorescence at all, you listed the wavelength ranges of the excitation and emission. Not not super hard to do. In terms of factors contributing to irreproducible irre research, one of the main ones I think is pressure to publish, which is kind of tied to selective reporting. When I've heard it mentioned a few times, like if you get a sample that's kind of messed up, but you just have to use it because you need to get that publication out, that's one of the things that can cause someone else not to be able to reproduce your research. The ones that are more pertinent to this talk and our actual whole series here, though are the methods for experimental design and raw data not being available. So we'll talk about all of those. And what can we do? Well, one of the things would have been to get a better quality image here, but they didn't have it in the original paper. Um, all of this, this first stuff is all focused on better mentoring, better teaching. Of course, better understanding st statistics would help us all. But this is all what we're doing here. And one particular thing I'm trying to help and focus on is enforcing making the journals enforce some standards, and that's part of what Quark is all about. So if you're interested in trying to strong arm some journals, sign up. Where did uh, those metrics come from? Um, yes, it was a survey of like, I think 1300 scientists or something. But again, if you download this, you can click on the image and you'll go to the paper of 1300 scientists. So yeah, a lot of this you can just, I'm gonna try and skip through and then, oh, I think I closed it. Anyway. Resources. So Quarplini, feel free to join. There's a bunch of different working groups here. Everything from, say, figures and reporting to checking laser stability, micrometa app, and... Uh, oh yeah, I read all of these last night and apparently did not copy the new version. Anyway, 
I'm going to kind of skip through this, but if you have any interest in um, quality control and validation, and I think this was brought up a bit earlier by Sir Pat, that the metric you use is very important. And I think Pete was partially involved in this at some points, but they have a lot of great examples about why you don't want to use certain metrics for certain things. And this is just one example where you have three objects, one's outsized or much larger than the others. And if you use a similarity coefficient, this actually looks like the better segmentation algorithm. You could just consider this algorithm one and algorithm two. And this one is considered worse, but this one actually picks up all three of your objects. So again, certain types of validation procedures are going to work better for certain types of analyses. Minor comic break, which we don't have time for, but if your data says no, pay attention. Fair principles. Oh, this one's going to be rough. Anyway, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, read about them. One of the things that can be issue an issue with being interoperable and reusable is if you use image analysis software, while well, it might be great, it might have a workflow instead of a macro that you can reproduce all your samples with. If people can't get access to it because it's like paid software or something, then they're going to be less likely to reproduce your results and you're less likely to get cited as well. In terms of being findable, uh, there's a bunch of data hosting options here. This was a chart produced by Beth Simony, just like to point out. Zenodo is completely free and can, you can put up to 50 gigabytes per collection and the collection could be you know, a single image and you use a few of those. And then there's a few other options you can look through there if you are interested in looking for hosting options. Uh, NAH guidelines, I think this was written when I was expecting to do this on the first day or second day, mm -hmm. but you do need to keep data for three years on certain NIH grants. So using those hosting options in the previous slide can be very important. Let's skip through that because they've other people have already introduced the checklist papers. Uh, scripting is great. Scripting is like your lab notebook. Actually, really, the workflow tab is like your lab notebook. Scripting is more of your lab report at the end. Um, but it is important to mention any manual processing, and it's good to include what you expect the input and output to be in the script itself. So someone hasn't doesn't have to like dig through your methods in your paper or maybe the supplements to figure out how they were supposed to use your scripts. And again, always include, include software versions. I'm trying to get better about that myself. Yes, because you might be the person reading your scripts a few months later after you've submitted it and are needing to do some extra processing. Um, yeah, no. Uh, yeah. Okay, moving on. Stardust is an example of great open source code. Uh, it's, you know, once you have it in plugins for a variety of different software packages, more and more people will use it. And once the software is nice and usable and accessible, you'll get other people creating external contributions like Pete's integration with QPath. And this was like a whole thing written by Robert Hayes about using Stardust and Napari with GPU support. And you've heard about all the pain with using GPU supported things in earlier talks. And yeah, people will create nice little guidelines for your, your work and make it easier to use. And oh yes, the alternative story there about how that came about. Thanks for digging that up. Uh, Cellpose is the only one that's really nice. The code is all available. They also have the entire data set you can download for training. They even have a test site they created, so you can just drag and drop an image in there and see what your results might look like with the basic model and some basic settings. Do be careful about how you interpret that, though, because it does, like, resize your image and some other things. So if the results don't look great, it might not be that Cellpose isn't the right tool for you. It might just be that the limitations of the web implementation are, you know, small. And then there's lots of videos showing the use and easy retraining, and again, all of these things together can make it a lot more likely for people to reuse your stuff as opposed to just posting a script on the GitHub, linking it into your paper, and then being done with it. Uh, manual annotations. This has come up a little bit when you've been training all of your classifiers. Any training data, it would be best to include, if at all possible. Um, when you, say, create that Zenodo um, repository and upload all of your data, the say deep learning uh, or the objects you're using for training, if they're saved as a JSON file are actually really small usually. And so just including that information won't take up much space and can be very useful for someone else trying to replicate your data or look at what yeah, you did. Five seconds left. Okay, that's in controls, <laughs> biology and genetics. Humans, humans are not mice, things are hard. Um, gotta pay attention to scanners, settings, hospital labs. Do better. So you sometimes just need manual thresholding, depending on what your source of your variables are. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting at this point to ask for a submissions from the audience for all the different possible batch effects, and we could put together a document, but not going to happen now. And there is, again, normalization can't fix everything. There are deep learning algorithms based on fairness. I thought was pretty cool because fairness is a concept often applied to social uses of deep learning. 
but you can also do it to like blind deep learning algorithms to like submissions from different hospitals on different scanners and things like that. Controls are good. You can say, I love you. We say, what's your negative control? Um, Examples of the controls are negative, secondary, isotype. We've kind of gone through that. If you look at the slides, you can get some more details on what secondary and isotype controls actually are and how they work. And that was the SARS-CoV example you actually saw. Again, test on a small sample set whenever possible. And this is in general, whenever you're planning an image analysis project, Prob problems can pop up all along the pipeline. So don't, you know, invest all of your tissue from all of your rare samples and like go all in on the first try and then find out that you missed a, you have too much autofluorescence and you can't see your signal or something like that and you need to bleach it. Like there's, take the time to go through with a small subset. And again, always do your negative control. And I'm just gonna not talk about color, even though I had some cool gifts and make sure you keep all of your images super bright. JPEG encoding example, bias, selection bias. It's very easy for us to all just say, when you're picking training data, say these are the easy ones or the center of an object, you really want to go for edges and edge cases and give yourself a sticky note on your monitor if you have to remind yourself. Um, and the monitors have, the monitors can impact things. I mentioned rare cell fetcher before from Sarah. Go check that on the forum. This is a link to it. What? You don't have that. Less than half. Much less. I don't remember. Okay. Uh, and I do have some validation scripts on the forum if you want to test out um, getting like a confusion matrix for some of your training data. But you got to be careful how you use that because these validation attempts using manual annotations can be subject to the same bias that I mentioned before, where you pick a lot of very easy to define examples for your validation data. And then it looks like your classifier is really good, but it's just because you picked easy examples for your validation data. So in conclusion, be part of the solution. Mitigate selection bias, and yes, this was going to be before dinner on the second day, but it's not anymore. <laughs>